and uh, many thanks indeed to the PFLA and the Woodland Trust too for asking us down here today. Um, that's me and if, is there a, ah, this is where I need my glasses. <laughs> is it that right one? Okay. There we are. Um, what I'm hoping to do today is to e explain and explore uh, a wee bit about how we've dealt with and approached this, what, have, what for many is a tricky issue, but trees and livestock, oh, excuse me, um, on this property here, which my wife and I, my wife's here today, Seanach, um, which we uh, farm, we're in Highland Perthshire here, we're on the southern edge of the Cairngorms, west of Pitlochry, we're looking north here, a place called Fincastle, and I don't know if you, can you read the, the back, the, the basic stats? Yeah, yeah, that's grand. Um, the farm sits uh, mostly above 1,000 feet, it runs roughly from just under 1,000 feet up to just under 1,500 feet, so a fairly typical upland, uh, low fertility, very low P, very low K soils, uh, Lindsay was talking about there. Um, it's uh, a cattle sheep enterprise. The sheep, it's Texel Clin, cross with the aim of producing a, a fat lamb off these pastures. Cattle are sold, forward stores, 15, 18 months old, uh, and um, it's a grass based system. Um, you'll notice that a wee bit over 10% of the farm is woodland, thanks largely to the activities of previous generations here. Much of it is in the form of that plantation you see there. We also have, like typical many farms, uh, a number of shelter belts. And you're seeing some here, nothing new here. Uh, dating back into the 19th century, you see some remnant trees from Victorian shelter wood systems there. 1960s ones up the top, one felled in the middle ground and a early effort from ourselves in the 1990s. And this would be absolutely characteristic of the way most folk, this kind of picture, would, the way most folks would think of farm woodlands. Um, you hear a lot of talk about integrating trees and farms, farm woodlands. And people think in a fairly standard way the trees are grown on one block of land and the livestock's grown, is kept out of that. And uh, there's variance in this. Whenever you hear anyone talking about integration of farm woodland, mostly, I have to say, not in the farming industry. It's mostly folks outside the farming industry. Uh, you can pretty much tell what they're talking about depending where they've come from. So in our experience, if you're talk, hearing someone from Confo talk about that, they're interested in that plantation bit. Maybe the folks on the shooting side, they're talking about the shelter belts or the farm advisory service and so on and so on. And that's the way that we traditionally thought about it. Um, but as we took down the fences or the fences fell down and we thinned these and we saw how our livestock were using these woodlands or not using them, we changed our kind of approach and it's obvious rather obvious now in hindsight, but it was uh, a rather slow process. Um, and we started, as we looked at planning to replace some of these shelter belts and thinking about new ones, we suddenly thought, this is daft to think in this term of where you keep your animals out of the wood and until 30 years down the line, and then somehow or other let them back in. Why not plan to get those benefits from as early a point as possible? So why not plan the replacement shelter woods, which we were having to do because the Forestry Commission tell us we have to do it. Um, when, they, when you cut them down, you've got to replant them. So why not plan them with the aim of getting those maximum benefits for the livestock from as early a point as possible? So that was our, if you like, a kind of light bulb moment. And um, what it's done is to free up the way we think about this. Uh, it's got us out of this competitive mindset where you don't want to give up a piece of ground to trees because the livestock, you're going to lose the value 
to your livestock enterprise of that. And, and I think folks who are farmers, and there'll be a lot of farmers here today, will understand that. But that's a conflict that goes on internally. It goes on externally, too, between the forest industry on the one side and the, you, you know the situation, I'm sure. Um, so this is what I want to talk about today. And as soon as you're into this multi-cropping, you're talking about what the different crops need. In this case, let's start with the sheep. Um, and Lindsay's talked about wind speed and temperature. We know that there's key issues for sheep, along with the obvious ones of forage quality and uh, quantity. What I would say in our experience working with these sheep breeds is that their preference is on most time for open ground <coughs> habitats. And let's be quite plain about that. The sheep doesn't appear to be a woodland animal. But it uses woods, these woodlands, at two key times for us. One is in winter storms, particularly in snow, and they'll use the full extent of these woods. And that's very important for them from an energetics point of view. And the other is in spring, where you find the uh, effects of the canopy have advanced spring grass. And they're right through it. And that's another key point for us. Spring grass is what we think about and plan for. Uh, it's absolutely crucial time for the yow. So, quickly moving on, the cattle are quite different. Cattle really behave, as I'm sure anyone here who has cattle and they get into woods, they are woodland animals, they like woods, absolutely. A very different set of issues. Here's some heifers being moved from remnants of the Victorian shelter, shelter wood system I was talking about, and uh, a younger one behind. Um, and here it's much more, the issue is much more shelter from rain, sun. Um, but then the trees have needs, and this is where the good folks in the Woodland Trust come in. They'll tell you all about trees and soils and what you can plant, and there's not time here today to go through that. It's a rich, rich subject. I just want to pull out two things. And uh, it's that... People often seem to forget that trees, particularly in exposed upland situations, really benefit from having other trees around about them. And it's a very simple thing, but it's extraordinary how often that seems to be forgotten by foresters as well as by anyone in the farming community. And the last point, you've, trees are not a crop that you can walk away from. What crop can you walk away from if you're farming? You don't. You look after them. You've got to look after trees, and that's no different from your sheep, your cattle, or your grass. The, there's a third crop, at least a third crop in here, and that's the forage underneath, which is a key part of what you're trying to do in a pastoral woodland system. I haven't got a picture of grass because everyone knows what grass looks like, but um, it's slightly complicated, that one, because it depends what kind of ground you're planting and what scale you're planting at. Uh, but I'll come back to that, if I may. Um, so we've made the jump mentally into thinking, we've been freed up thinking about where you can put your trees and what scale you can work at. So there's two key things here that have been for us. One is scale, and one is, uh, which le and connected to that, is how you protect your trees. And essentially, the, way, the approach we've had, and we've had now for a, a long time, is to use these tree tubes uh, when you're working at a small scale, so half, a, half an, acre, an acre kind of size or less. And this is, just, this is just about money. But it's also about the fact we've had bad experiences working with small enclosures. Coming from the early agri-environment schemes, you have wee little enclosures, including this and that. That's a horror to manage, and animals don't like it, we don't like it. So we've gone down the line of using tree tubes which bring real problems with them, as I'm sure anyone knows uh, here. Um, animals like to itch. Well, the thing that you've got to watch out for here, so sheep get access through that, and we use a hot wire to keep the cattle off. And these are just standard tree stakes <coughs> and tubes. And in this particular site, I think we've maybe lost about 10% to sheep rubbing. But the key thing, the sheep rub for a reason, and normally it's biting lice and you've got to keep your sheep clean, and you should be doing that. We should be doing that anyway, but uh, if, you've got itchy, if you've got sheep carrying a lice burden, don't try this at home. <laughs> it, it's not going to work. Um, but our, the issue, and we haven't always got this right, absolutely not, when you take these trees off in exposed situations, you can, uh, the, 
problem with these tree tubes is getting a, a stable tree at the end of the process. But it does allow you to graze through, and that helps from the bureaucracy point of view because, you, well, I'm sure you've got the same thing in England, but there's an absolute nightmare uh, farm grant situation on this little portions of land and separate FIDs and all the rest of it. I'm, I'm sure you all know that. So you're wanting to avoid that as much as possible. So uh, flexive fencing here, so you can try and claim that it's not permanent fencing, helps you maintain sensible field boundaries in your IX mapping, all this kind of stuff. But when you move up a scale, what we've done is to use a stock fence Conventional stock fence and conventional woodland establishment uh, 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 approach. So using on, on bigger scale, and I'm talking here, uh, the biggest one we've done, I think, is five hectares. So you're looking then at using what we've done is in the hardwoods used um, uh, the kind of material used in um, hedge protection, easy wraps with canes, and everyone will know that. And that's to give you protection for voles and hares. Um, and then aim to get the sheep in as early as possible. And as soon as the leaders are out of browse height, we've had sheep in. So if you get the trees away quickly, and that depends on soil fertility and your ability to get the trees established properly, handling the trees properly, uh, four, four or five years, and you've got the sheep back in there. So you've got to plan how you're going to co manage your stock over that four or five year gap. Um, the Scottish Government have a grant for this type of approach, but it's not, in our eyes, it's not worth picking up on. It's going to cost us more money to go into the grant scheme because they ask you for dirty great big stobs. There's more timber in the tree, in the tree protection than there will ever be in the tree. And weld mesh guards. And, and that's to protect the public investment. And I understand that. But the money involved in that and the labour of putting that in is just horrifying. Uh, so we've gone down this road and you accept some losses um, in this, on, the smaller, uh, on the smaller areas. Um, electric fencing is a key part here for us as well of managing not just the stock, but we've got big issues with red deer coming onto the farm. Big, big issues. Uh, so scare wires off for red deer is something that we use and we use on the grass pastures too because they're a nightmare. Um, from a, life, from a, a grass management point of view alone. So we've got into pastoral woodland and you immediately start to think about what species mix. And again, it's a complex subject, depends on your soils, but you're trying to manage this, this uh, having a light canopy to allow a gr uh, grass to grow underneath, but you're also wanting shelter from the rain, sun and snow, and some of the heavier canopy species suit that. So Scots pine in the uplands is an obvious one, um, which would suit a larger scale establishment approach because it doesn't do in tubes, obviously. Um, so we've gone down the pine birch, or also the oak round, cherry birch, but it's a rich subject, and there's not, again, time today to discuss all that. The Woodland Trust folks would be the ones to talk about there. Ash and larch would be key species here, but disease has caused us grief on, on, on those fronts. And that's a real shame, ash in here in this picture, which are starting to show signs of dieback. Um, the oak and rowan one is... Uh, I think of interest anyway because we were quite keen to see oak on the place for uh, utilitarian reasons, but um, again we didn't. We know that nothing will grow under a heavy oak canopy, so we're planning to run that those stands on a, a coppice-based system, coppice and standards, with the aim of maintaining of uh, uh, some element of field layer underneath that uh, over. A rotation. Um, but it naturally, this, this, this uh, conflict between a light canopy and protection takes you towards mixtures and there's other reasons to go down the mixtures route and to think of, think of that. But then possibly most importantly is planting patterns and here on ground that you can manage then you can uh, get a tractor onto and do something about the grass. 
alley planting seems a sensible way to go, and that's what we've done in this kind of strip system. We've been constrained by grant systems. Here's an example here where we used the public grant system. Had to, really. Um, it made so much sense to do so financially. But we were constrained by the rules of the grant. Um, and so, ideally, we would have had the trees tighter and the grass alleys broader. But uh, whether the government um, uh, bean counters will ever allow that to change, I don't know. But uh, it's something to work on, I feel, anyway. Group planting would be the other way to go. Um, and clearly, in some places, natural regeneration tends to give you this mixed uneven planting, and that's worth considering, but I would only, we would certainly only think about it where you were starting to see advanced regen, because the timescales are too long for us to manage on the farm. Um, and then you've got to think about how you manage your animals inside that wood, and that's about having enough open space in the wood and plants so you can see how you've managed your stock out of that. Um, and that's when you're working at these bigger scales. So uh, it's, a key, it's a key part of the design. Um, and you've got to start, you're starting from that viewpoint. Where, how, where are the animals going to want to rest? Where are they going to want to gather? What lines are they going to move on to? Move, move when you're moving them with, well, with sheep, with dogs and cattle, you are uh, using more um, cunning means to get them to think they want to move, not dogs. The, so lastly, we've maybe three reasons why we want to see more of this. We would envisage moving uh, the woodland element on this farm upwards and possibly towards 20% without affecting our stock production. Um, the first reason is this spring grass kind of issue and the shelter. <coughs> Um, the second issue is, I, the reason I suppose is simply that we see the trees as potentially having a value. The current ones have had, we've, been, we've found that useful. We're hoping that what we're planting will be useful for next generations. But the third reason is a carbon one. And um, we did the carbon audit uh, at the business level. We are carbon positive. But we don't know how to capture that value on the livestock enterprise. But if you were to look at it more critically, you'd find that much of that carbon positive balance was due to that plantation resource. Now, the, that's not relevant to the livestock enterprise. These pastoral woodlands are. So the way we think about it is that if someone starts to look at this critically, uh, we would want to have enough resource sequestering carbon through the tree side to allow us to claim carbon, at least carbon neutral or carbon positive meat. We have no way of knowing just now how we can capture that value in the marketplace. But my gosh, we need that politically just now. That's our feeling anyway. Um, so that's one reason that we're really interested in trying to push that. But uh, it, it's. Relevant to our upland situation, this, that approach probably isn't relevant to the more intensive lowland situation. There will be other ways of doing that, renewable energy and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So anyway, those are the, uh, th that's what's informing us and these are some of the issues that we've been grappling with. Um, yes, there have been failures, of course there have. Uh, trees have died, um, etc. These heights, we don't really have a problem with the livestock and trees. We don't have the fly problem, which immediately everyone will want to talk about uh, if you're on the more low ground situation. But uh, so the problems have more come from the tree end rather than the livestock end in our, in our experience. But uh, by and large, it seems to be working. And we are carrying on, on with the mindset of expanding this woodland resource. So, I think that's enough for me for the moment. Is that okay, time-wise?